Well, hello. Let's pray. Father, as we learn from Jesus today, help us with our fears and our doubts. Help us to trust in Jesus more. Amen. Well, the picture of Jesus walking on water is one of those enduring images that everyone loves. It's an iconic moment. Now, this is a green basilisk, commonly known as a Jesus lizard. It can walk, or rather run, on water, hence it got the name. Walking on water is an idea that fascinates. I don't think many people know what to make of it, but it looks great. One reaction is to try to do it by some means. Isn't that what surfing is all about? And there are some marvellous inventions as well. The idea of walking on water has captured our imagination, but we tend to respond in, in quite a silly way, don't we? The disciples were confronted by the one who really could walk on water, the Son of God. How did they respond? In short, badly. They responded first with fear and then with doubt. But Jesus taught them some lessons about being his disciples. And these are lessons that we can learn from too, about how we should respond to the Son of God. And he says, do not fear, do not doubt. The power of the Son of God is available to all. So first, let's think about that first thing. Do not fear. Verses 22 to 27. Jesus dismissed the crowd, sent his disciples off fishing and went to pray alone. Meanwhile, the weather is getting increasingly worse on the lake. Look at verse 24. The boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It's the fourth watch of the night, which is between three o'clock and six o'clock in the morning. And uh, oh, the men are going to be tired and dispirited. The grey light of morning just filtering through the mist and the spray. And then their hollow eyes fix on a strange sight. There's a figure walking towards them, walking on the waves. Jesus came to them walking on the sea. If you look at verse 26, it doesn't say whether they recognised him or not. They just maybe thought he was some sort of ghost. And they were terrified. Jesus had calmed a storm. He just did an amazing thing with some bread and fish. And he implied that he was going to catch up with them. Who else could it be? And who better? That they should be relieved. But, but they aren't tuned in. They're, they're, they're predisposed to fear rather than trust in the power of Christ. Jesus says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Faith, not fear, is the right response to Jesus. Faith in him, faith in, in his power to save us, faith in his love to be willing to save us. And this is a moment of revelation, a glorious moment. Christ comes to be with his disciples. He comes to dispel their fear. And fear can be a barrier. As lockdown restrictions are lifted, will you venture out into those public places? Will you send your children to school? Will you travel? That's fear. And do we entertain fear that becomes a barrier to seeing Jesus? Does our faith, fear, fear uh, displace our faith in Christ? What fe fears stop you from seeing Christ? Maybe it isn't the ghosts of the dead, but the ghosts of the living. Fear of what others think of you. Their spirits sit in the front stalls of your self-esteem like a fiendish panel of X-Factor judges. You can't see Jesus who loves you, who died for you, because you're lost in a fog of worry about being valued and appreciated by your critical cohort of contemporaries. You fear their judgment, you long for their approval. You've made them unknowing idols, passive worship targets, Silent stakeholders in your ambitions, unwitting masters of your worldview. And if I'm describing this problem accurately, it's because I know the territory all too well in my own life. Jesus says, do not fear. 
Do not fear the ghosts of others. Do not fear anything. Do not fear the curse of ill health. Do not fear the loss of material wealth. Do not fear the threats of evil people. Do not fear uncertainty. Do not fear change. Do not fear rejection. Do not fear loneliness. Do not fear suffering. Do not fear pain. Do not fear death. Jesus has the answer to the sum of all fears. He has an answer to death. He stands over the deep and is not drawn down into it. Take courage. Jesus is here. Do not fear. He knows your name. If you're living for him now, you'll be living with him forever. Do not fear. Or well, second, do not doubt, verses 28 to 33. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, verse 28, tell me to come to you on the water. I think this is a response of a follower of Jesus who wants to join in with him, doing his miraculous works. Jesus has been encouraging that in chapter 10 and even in the recent feeding miracle. So Jesus says, come. And Peter is over the side, tottering over the surging peaks and troughs towards Jesus. Then it all goes a bit wrong, verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and, and, and cried out, Lord, save me. Peter started to doubt. He was being held up by nothing other than Jesus' power. His senses suddenly tune into his surroundings, the, the howling gale, the raging sea. His faith in Christ vaporises and his body is plunged into the water. And he screams for help. Well, he still has faith in Christ to save him. Jesus responded immediately. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And Peter's experience is an excellent picture of doubt. Jesus is there with demonstrable power over the wind and the waves, standing on the water without sinking. But Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and starts to focus on the wind. Our life in Christ is sustained by God's grace. We're like Peter on the waves. Jesus holds us up miraculously. We have no way to God without him. We have no hope beyond this world without the cross. We have no future in eternity without the resurrection. Without faith, we sink into doubt and hopelessness. But you know, we can all struggle with doubt from time to time. What makes us doubt? What takes our focus off Jesus? What seems more credible and believable than the Lord of glory? So we reject our hope in him. Or perhaps the storms of life hollow out, hollow out um, gaps of uncertainty. A breakdown of a relationship with parents, with a brother or sister, with a husband or wife. And the greater part of our identity as a Christian seems to have been eroded away because we were in a Christian family, we were in a Christian couple. Or what about if the person who led you to Christ falls away? I've seen that happen to people. Or what about if the church lets you down? Guilt can be a real catalyst to doubt, can't it? How can we be sure of our faith when we face up to our continuing failures. Personal tragedy can leave us cold with despair. Grief, loss, illness. Where is God? It could actually be something positive rather than negative. Have you ever met someone who says, oh, I've grown out of Christian faith. It offered something once, but now I've moved on. I just want to focus on my career or my family. But I know that some Christians just get waves of doubt. And it can be a lonely struggle. You have to put on a face for your friends from church, your parents or your children. You feel ashamed. You feel like a fraud. But it is not unusual. What should we do then when we feel doubt? Well, the answer is on the way is with Peter. Keep our eyes on Jesus. 
I love taking people out to do my favourite thing, which is rock climbing. Uh, one thing that they have to do with this activity is to trust me. We're all jo chatty and jolly, yomping up the hill to the outcrop, but very soon they put their lives into my hands. Uh, it's my experience that almost everyone is all right climbing up. It's when it comes to abseiling back down that things get interesting. If they look around or more likely look down and uh, feel very, very exposed and decide to stop listening to me and act impulsively. And what do I need to do? I need to reform the relationship with me and to build their trust in order to get them down. Because unless they trust me, they'll just keep doing daft things or, or just refuse to budge. I think doubt is like this. It's not merely perceptional, it's relational. It's not about how things look. It's about in whom we trust. If we are struggling with doubt, we need to look to Jesus. We need to work on a relationship with Jesus. How do we relate to Jesus? Well, through his word and through his body, the church, through his people. I can tell you that nothing encourages my faith more and hearing about people becoming Christians or hearing about people's experience as Christians in their lives. If you have that sinking feeling, a really simple thing to do is to get a Christian friend around and just ask them about their Christian story and then we'll share yours and then share what's going on for you. It's a great place to start. The Son of God has come into the world. When Jesus gets into the boat, the storm ceases and the disciples worship him. Uh, and for the first time, they declare, verse 33, Truly you are the Son of God. Jesus is with them. Their fear has allayed. Their faithful, faithlessness has attenuated. Their doubt is curtailed. Jesus really is the Son of God. Do not fear. Do not doubt. Thirdly, the power of the Son of God is available to all. Verses 34 to 36. They get over to the other side. Jesus is recognised instantly. Here is the powerful Jesus Christ. Word goes out to the villages and the farms and, and people come in droves. And look at the end of verse 35. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. It's Jesus for all. Easy access Messiah. The point is, Jesus came to the world to bring everyone access to his saving power. Everyone who believes in him. He really is the Son of God. He could walk on water. He can separate us from our sins and bring us life forever with our Father in heaven. Have faith in him. Do not fear. Do not doubt. The power of the Son of God is available for all. Well, let's pray. Father, strengthen our faith in our powerful and loving Saviour, Jesus Christ, so that, Lord, we are lifted up when we are sinking into fear or doubt. And we ask this in his name. Amen.